What is up, everybody? It is Dr. Vibe here, host and producer of the Ordinary Dr. Vibe Show, the home of Epic Conversations, and I'm the host of Epic Conversations 2022 Best Pod. No, 2020. We're in 2022. 2020 Best Podcast News Award winner, 2018 Innovation Award winner given out by the Canadian Ethnic Media Association. I also co-host and co-produce the only online show in the world for dads and fathers that's sponsored by Dove Men Plus Care. And as always, I'd like to say you're blessed, highly favored, a magnet for miracles, and a solution for someone's problem. And we are broadcasting live on September 24th. Yes, October. October is coming around the corner. But we still here, family. It's still somewhat warm here in Toronto. We got some decent weather that's, that's hanging out. But... Sunday afternoons, Sunday afternoons, Black Canada Talking around 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Black Canada Talking is a live online event that provides Black Canadians the opportunity to express their POVs and give their takes on things that are of importance to them. And also, we just like to spotlight great Black Canadians too. But today, we have back on uh, a Black Canada Talking OG. I'm saying that respectfully. Oh, gee. And uh, where, and, uh, man, I mean, I'm underdressed today. Check this out. <laughs> Check. <laughs> Check this out. Cesar, how are you today, sir? I'm good, Dr. Vab. I'm good, my people. Thank you always for having me. It's always, always an honor. And thanks for the compliments. You know, it's my, uh, it's my usual, but today uh, we have a, uh, my niece's fourth uh, fourth birthday, so I just had to throw something on, right? Oh, you just had <laughs> I just so this is what he just has to throw on, family. Can you imagine when he <laughs> takes some time? Like, come on now, I just I just have to throw something on. What's going on in regards to everyday life for you? I know you do a lot of stuff for a lot of organizations. What you've been up to lately? Well, uh, allow me to promote. Oh, I actually don't have one of the flyers here, but. I would definitely send that to you. Um, I want to give a shout out to our CEO, Ketia Peters, and program yes. director, Mark Jacob of Roots and Culture Canada for the great program they are running uh, for our black youth in regards to basketball, pizza, but also mentoring uh, in partnership with Black History Ottawa. So uh, this Thursday, well, last Thursday, uh, I got to uh, speak to the youth regard uh, leadership and justice in Canada. Mm. And at the same time, uh, of course, giving uh, trainings and conferences uh, in Ottawa and outside of Ottawa. Um, as you know, there's a rise of hate and also there's a pushback against EDI, anti-black racism education. And, you know, it becomes eventually a conflict of values, uh, as notably this week um, in different cities across Canada that were protesting yes. against, um, yes. against LGBT yes. education. But this also happened in, overseas in Europe, uh, in Europe, uh, such as in Belgium, uh, in the same week where, uh, notably in Africa, Kenya is looking at passing a law uh, you know, that basically would condemn up to the death sentence uh, people who are deemed LGBTQ. So, you know, like I tell my black people, it has nothing to do in terms of, uh, when I say embrace, in terms of, you know, you yourself being LGBTQ. It's a matter of respect and dignity of others, of the difference, and it becomes a matter of values, values in terms of the type of society that we want to live in because and you know sometimes black people hate when there's comparison between let's say lgbtq and the black cause but the last time lgbtq people were deemed illegal was also a time in which black people lived under segregation and colonization um you know and let's never forget honoring people like james baldwin and uh, uh martin luther king mentor Bayard Rustin, the LGBTQ movement began with Black people. That's very important. You know what? I, I just want to interrupt before we go any further. So uh, a few things before we get started today. Um, mm -hmm. As always, if you haven't done it yet, I want to encourage you to subscribe to the Dr. Vibe Show YouTube channel. 
and hit the net notification button so you get notified for upcoming conversations. Also, like the Dr. Vibe Show on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. Two, if you want to advertise your business product or service on the show, please email me at dr. Period, V-I-B-E at the dr. V-I-B-E-S-H-O-W dot com. And love to do that. Now, we got some people who are chimed in. Uh, one of the wonderful, I haven't seen a, this person in a while, green eyed little baby. She usually chimes in on State of Things with Aisha, Jill, and Lala, but she's here this afternoon when we're broadcasting live. Great. And she goes, she is good. And she's great finally to get a notification for your show. Yay. So it, it comes through. And before we went live, Cesar and I, we had two topics we wanted to chat about. But I would like him to talk a little bit deeper on this subject since he already chatted about because this past week in across Canada, and he was saying globally, there were arrests, heated exchanges at Mark rallies over LGBTQ school policies. So, so Cesar, if you're comfortable, let's de delve a little de de deeper Sorry, into this, con this topic. Uh, yeah, no, uh, look, I, how can I put it? Oh, sorry, <laughs> my light just went a little bit darker. No, no uh, I am absolutely in support of our brothers and sisters who are LGBTQ. I am a Pan-Africanist, and yes, most Pan-Africanists oppose LGBTQ rights because most Pan-Africanists are actually uh, Christians or Muslims. Uh, you know, people often hear me talk about religion, but that's exactly what it is. Religion is the main driver of homophobia, whether we talk about homosexuality, going to hell, uh, false links with pedophilia, etc., etc. So protests that have occurred across cities actually also happen, as I was saying, um, in Europe. But what most people don't realize is that it is religious extremists, uh, aka integrist extremist religious groups that tend to drive them. Although it is true. 100% that there are concerned parents. There are concerned parents who feel, you know, five, six years old is too young to teach about sex to the kids in elementary school and that it is not the job of the school teacher to do so. I could almost agree with that if it wasn't of the fact that, indeed, there are children who do have questions about such things in regards to the society and the times that they live in. And the course in questions are not a matter of teaching kids to be gay or lesbian, such type of fears. It's more in terms of focusing on empathy and compassion and an opening to the difference. I know a lot of Black people will criticize me here without even knowing what these courses are about, without even having knowledge of what they are about. But two very important things I will tell our Black people, and Dr. Vibe, I think you know notably of the first one. Although we are under a conservative government here in Ontario, the conservative government of Doug Ford, when they came in, they scrapped notably the EDIA and LGBT education that was there under the liberal government of Kathleen Wynne. But then they reintroduced something that was even more progressive. So this, this government is very pragmatic in terms of adapting itself to the realities of the landscape. The same government that in 2020, when a certain George, Ford, uh, George Floyd got killed, Doug Ford said there's no systemic racism in Ontario. A matter of, what, 24, 48 hours later, recognizing that there is systemic racism in Ontario. Pragmatism, adjustment. So the very conservative government that's present here, and Doug Ford really does not embark too much on social conservatism. Although, of course, there's rhetoric against the the woke, the extreme woke. This is another thing. Black people, I am woke. I'm proud to be woke. My family is woke. I want every black person to be woke because being woke started with black people a hundred years ago. This was part of our, uh, the Pan-Africanist movement to be woke, to be awake to the oppression of the state against black people. Stay awake, stay woke. That's where it comes from. White conservatives have basically polluted that term to speak of extreme leftists that they call woke. The other thing I want to bring 
uh, to the knowledge of our listeners is that we're in 2023, 70 to 50 years ago, following the Supreme Court decision in the United States of Brown versus Board of Education that led to the desegregation of the school system, started the notions of adjustment and education of white children to the black counterparts, to the black schoolmates, educating them in terms of notions such as, you know, black skin is not evil, black skin is not chocolate, black skin doesn't make you dirty. You know, the type of education that a certain Dunham, uh, I think her first name was Victoria Dunham, but that white woman will make the lie about Emmett Till. You know, this type of education becomes necessary to create a better society. And when I say better society, and I know many black people hate when, why do you have to talk about the black plight when you talk when the topic is about LGBTQ? But because there are links in terms of oppression of people. It's like talking about the genocide of black people and not seeing links with the genocide of, for example, Jewish people in terms of how people become turned into objects to make it easier to kill them. So here, what I'm saying to our people, absolutely I can understand the concern of parents, not to be black parents in terms of what is taught to the kids at school. But I would invite them to pay attention and to stop falling for the videos and the rhetorics of the extremists in terms of you know, always the sensational video to bring people to be excited and to be angry. Many of these anti-LGBTQ protests, it's extreme Muslim and Christian organizations that are behind them. And white conservatives. And white conservatives. You think I'm going to align myself to those people? The same people who tomorrow will turn against you. I mean, it made me laugh when I saw a veiled Muslim woman protesting against this, fully knowing that they are protesting with people who tomorrow we tell them, go back to your country. Mm. So these are the type of realities that our people don't want to see. Absolutely no. Like, I cannot tell you, as notably a consultant who work in the education sector, I cannot tell you of a school board that is embracing teaching sexuality to children in elementary school. But I can tell you of school board, including Catholic school boards, that have become open to LGBTQ education in terms of embracing the difference and making children feel well in the skin, no matter the sexual orientation might be, and no matter what the sexual orientation of the parents might be. Those are two very fundamental things. Okay. Uh, good stuff. I got I had some follow conversation on this subject. Again, Green Eye Little Baby says, great subjects. The world has become so hateful be towards people seen as different. We all weren't meant to be the same. That's why our maker created different colors, human plants, and animals. For me, it's what? a matter of respect and dignity. That's all it is. It's not a matter of, uh, you know, like, no, it's respecting respect the right to live, the right to dignity of others without them having to hide themselves. Without them having to hide themselves. Why is it that, I mean, if a person is LGBTQ, well, they're not bothering you, let them live their life. I mean, I don't I don't see an anti-heterosexual movement here. No, 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 no. It's uh, so, and unfortunately, this type of anti-LGBTQ hate uh, homophobia, and some people think homophobia just means having fear of homosexuals. No, you don't need to be afraid of homosexuals, but you you basically cultivate a certain fear, a certain hatred towards them, and black communities that tend, black communities tending to be more religious than others, tend to be reinforced with and with homophobic messages at church, just at the, in the mosque and in black families. Black families tend to be more socially conservative than the norm. Okay. Um, and she also follows up saying, you don't have to accept someone's differences, but you should respect their right to life just like they accept yours. Absolutely. Respect Absolutely. and dignity. That's all it is. Cesar, so do you, is this another component 
the of the area that you work in. You you talk about equality, and this has this now become an, a frontline issue also because you know over the last few years, George Floyd equity has this become now a frontline issue. And what are parents coming to you with, either pro or not pro, when it comes to this subject? Well, it is a frontline issue. I am very proud uh, that I have helped to introduce the LGBTQ flag in child welfare agencies uh, in the Eastern Zone. I've promoted the Philadelphia LGBTQ flag, which now people have seen with the black and brown bar, uh, because before it was only the rainbow without the black and brown bar. So the, the city of Philadelphia is the one that first came up with the black and brown bar to honor the fact that LGBTQ activism began at Stonewall in New York City with black, notably black activists. And we know about uh, people like James Baldwin, et cetera. And let's never forget Martin Luther King, our very respected leader and hero, Martin, Martin Luther King, his mentor, Bayard Rustin, was openly gay. And he was respected by Martin Luther King just as by Malcolm X. But in that time, being LGBTQ was not an issue, notably in the black community. It became an issue following the 1980s and 90s, notably with white conservatives' money going into black churches and starting to change the narrative. These are documented factual things. So uh, to come back to your question, I personally don't deal and address parents per se. Uh, I speak more uh, with senior leaders and public servants, and it's a matter of educating them. Now, there is resistance. Uh, on, one, on one side, there's a general resistance in society regarding EDI uh, and everything that comes under the umbrella of EDI, indigenous issues, anti-Black racism, LGBTQ disability, uh, immigration, etc. But there is also resistance and pushback, notably in terms of workers, notably public servants, in regards to feeling like uh, these are not values that they embrace, and some have decided to leave the agencies. Uh, some have had to be uh, to be told very straightforwardly, this is where we are going. You are either part of it or you basically would have to leave. Before some people start to think, oh, this is extremist and all that, in 2023, do you want to work in a workplace where someone expects to be hired, to be working, and to stay at work and say Black people are inferior? Women are inferior. Women are going to hell because they have menstruation. Black people are going to hell because, you know, the skin is the skin of the devil. You wouldn't accept that. So why is it that you would be okay with discrimination towards a certain type of group simply because they don't share your sexual orientation? You know, so uh, these are important things that we must recognize will contribute to that hatred. In 2016, um, I think it was in Miami, uh, the gay nightclub Pulse yes. in Orlando. Yes. Yep. And that shooting that happened, it was by an extremist Muslim person. But ultimately, it's not because he was Muslim. It's because he had he was extremist. As we know, extremists of all types, Muslim, Christian, Jewish, etc., do kill gay people. And ultimately, we have to recognize as Black people and as a Pan-Africanist, we have black people who get killed because of the sexual orientation that they didn't choose, that they're born with, that they will die with, just as us being heterosexual. I don't remember the day I chose to be a heterosexual, but I wouldn't want to live in a world, in a planet where because I'm heterosexual, I get killed. Because not long ago, we lived in a time where simply because I'm black, I'm living under segregation, colonization, slavery, etc. And I, I so I, I heard media about these protests. I didn't see, but I'd be curious to see how many people like us were involved in those protests, either pro or against. There's always black people involved. <laughs> There's always black people involved in these type of things. And I mean, and, and you know what? It's it's okay. Like I don't. If a black person feels so strongly regarding this issue, great. That's part of the integration in society. I will not. Um, I don't bash. A black person for where they stand at today because as our great hero Malcolm X said don't look down on the person who knows less than you today because there was a time when you didn't know as much as you know today 
So that's fine. It's the evolution and the progress of the person. I mean, we're talking about this here in terms of protest and people, you know, with science and all that, but we look at Africa where we have countries that are passing laws condemning to like years in jail and even the death sentence people for being gay. And this type of mentality comes from colonization by the uh, Arab Maghrebis with Islam and colonization by uh, the European Christians with the Bible. That's where it comes from. In terms of anthropology and sociology, there have not been found records of condemnation and killings of people for being LGBTQ in Africa prior to colonization and the arrival of the ideologies of Islam and Christianity. I cannot make this up. In Kemet, um, a former ancient black pharaonic Egypt, there was an interdiction of being gay for Pharaoh because Pharaoh represented the link between the gods and the people. And as such, he had to reproduce, a.k.a. the fertility of the Nile. But there have not been found proofs of people, even in Kemet, being killed for being gay. Meanwhile, we know people will get the death sentence for killing cats. Why killing cats? Because cats in Kemet, ancient pharaonic black Egypt, cats were necessary to preserve the grains for food against rodents. So if you kill the cat, you endanger the lives of many people. So we do have records that people will get killed for killing cats. But there are no records as far as I know, as I speak today, there are no records of people being killed for being LGBTQ. Hot topic, hot topic, hot topic. Love it, love it, love it, love it, love it. And again, it was something that, you know, just it just came up. It, it, so just, came up. it, it just came up. But, 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 you know, this shows, again, the weight of what our ignorance can produce as Black people. And when we think about whether it be in the Caribbean or in Africa, Mm -hmm. So many brothers and sisters being ostracized, being killed, being driven to suicide, also being driven to immigration, notably to come to countries like Canada. Yes. Simply because of the difference, because of the mindset of the colonizers, the enslavers with the so-called holy books. That is fundamentally a problem because in the world that we live in today, I dare anyone to come show me the white Europeans or white Arabs or white Jewish or white Indian people or Asian people who are victim of ostracism or led to suicide or killed by their own because of a black ideology. I challenge anyone to come bring me those examples. I don't know any. All right. So for a topic we had no idea we were going to chat about at the beginning, you know, that's, but that's where things are. There's so many things that come up with that. And that's a, and that's so I I think also too, uh, when I had hair and I used to when I was in high school I had a teacher named Mr. Patrick, yeah. grade nine consumer ed class, and he said something that I've never forgotten. He said back then he says everything that happens in the U.S. within ten years will hit Canada. This started in the U.S. a while back, like the battleground mm -hmm. over the last year or two in the United States, especially mm -hmm. politically, the school system. The school system, and now you see it's filtering up here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So definitely, we'll keep keep an eye on this story. What we're gonna do? Excuse me. We're gonna take a quick little break, probably a thirty second break, and we'll come back. And on the other side of the break, we're gonna talk about the Canada India squabble. Oh, actually, last night I was hosting State of Things with Aisha Jill and La. They said, Doctor Vibe, you gotta talk to us about that. You're not telling us about that, and they're based in the United States. So people in the U.S. are asking us about this, and mm -hmm. we're going to get a black Canadian lens on it from Cesar. I'll add a little bit myself. And then we're going to talk about a very special announcement from the U.N. that Cesar is involved in. So this is beautiful. So we'll be back in about 90 seconds. <laughs> you know, and, and that's what I feel like. You feel like you're the Harry Tubman of the mind. I am. I feel like I'm the Harry. I, I, I'm one of the Harry Tubmans of intelligent black people. Like, I want to liberate y'all from, like, being left behind and ignored <laughs> and, and being oblivious. Now, really, the rappers yeah. get all the attention. You know, seriously, does anybody else feel this way? Like, like ignorant black people, they'll be all up, you know, getting all the headlines on the shade room. Overly and, sexualized black o folks. Over, like, the, the, the twerkers and the 
you know, just just people that, you know, don't always represent the best of us, you know, the diversity, you know, like people like Dr. Vibe, like everybody should know about people like Dr. Vibe. Dr. Really Vibe should. is, he's trying to do good work for, for black people. Dr. Vibe from Toronto. Good to see you, my brother. Uh, Dr. Vibe. Everybody follow Dr. Vibe. He has a great Great show. He's very good at what he does, and I have a lot of respect for him. Okay, so let me um hop into this. What's up, Dr. Vibe? How you doing? Everybody, if you see Dr. Vibe in the chat, everybody go follow the Dr. Vibe show. Dr. Vibe is a real smart brother and a, a, a good human being, and I like the guy a lot. And, and he's very intelligent, and uh, I think everyone should pay attention to what he's got going on. We got to shine the spotlight on the intelligent black people out here that are really doing the good work. Uh, don't just pay attention to the rappers and the celebrities. You know, a lot of these people are losers. Your true winners are your people in your community that are really having your back, uh, you know, helping us to have stronger families and a stronger community. So Dr. Bob is in that category. So you might see the Dr. Bob show in this chat. If you see him, please go follow him. OK. All right. So All right. We are back with <coughs> Cesar on Black Canada Talking. And before I go any further, too, I want to say if you want to touch base with Cesar, there's his email address, present at Roots and Can Roots and Culture Canada .com, and also Facebook. There is his Facebook address. So we're back, second half of our conversation. And yeah, there's a lot of stuff going down with Canada and India these days. And so for those who don't know, uh just a, a high level, uh Canadian Pr Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, I think earlier on this week, accused the Indian government of aiding in the killing of a Sikh representative in Vancouver. I don't know exactly when it happened, sometime in the last year or so, and it's been going back and forth. India has sent back their asked, uh, sent back their Canadian ambassador to Canada. Canada's same thing. I also hear now that I think India has suspended passports for those who are traveling to India. I think I hear that. Uh, I was talking to an associate the other day who was planning to go to India next month. He says it's up in the air because he don't know if it would be allowed in the company or not. Cesar, what do you say about this interesting tit tot, tit for tot? So, I would say first and foremost, uh, <clears throat> in appearance, this is not a topic that concerns black people. Uh, we're talking Canada, India dispute. Uh, what seems to be the assassination of a Sikh militant. Uh, but I find uh, this dispute interesting in terms of what it can to be teach black people. First and foremost, allow me to say that um, I have, um, how can I put it? I've been well treated by this community, uh, the Sikh community. I've been to a good water, uh, basically the temple. Uh, I may have mispronounced the name. I apologize. Uh, I've been well received by Sikh people. Uh, I've been well, well, and I've been well received by people from India all over. Uh, so you're talking about Hindus, Buddhists, etc. Uh, so in appearance, it doesn't concern us, but we have to notice something here. Uh, it's beyond the assassination of a Sikh militant. Basically. Uh, the Sikh militant who uh, Canada says was killed by orders of the Indian government, it comes in a context of uh, India under the government of Prime Minister Modi having uh, an ethno, one would say ethno-religious nationalist government uh, of the, through the BJP party. Uh, basically, India for the Hindus, uh, to sum it up that way. But about 40 years ago, I think 1984, uh, the former Prime Minister of India, Indira Gandhi, uh, she's not the daughter of Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi, but the daughter of uh, Jawaharlal Nehru, the first Prime Minister of India. She had ordered what became known as uh, the massacre of the Golden Temple uh, that killed many Sikh. And one of the consequences was uh, not only the immigration of many Sikh people, notably coming to Canada, because Canada is the number one uh, immigration nation of Sikh people, uh, especially when you go to the 
uh, Brampton slash Toronto GTA area. And if you drive on the highway, like I do not only for work, you know about uh, a strong presence of Sikh drivers in the trucking industry. And mosques. There you go. So the other thing that's also important to understand is that one of the consequences is that Indira Gandhi, uh, that former prime minister, well, her bodyguards were actually sick. So they killed her. They basically assassinated her for having ordered uh, the attack on the Golden Temple of the community. Long story short, we're coming 40 years now. India is rising. India is rising on the world stage. India is part of the BRICS. Uh, India is now part of, uh, no, not part. India is the nation with the highest demographics in the world. It has surpassed China, I believe, earlier this year, if not last year, but I think earlier this year. So how does that even relate to what we're talking about in regards to black people? Well, 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 well. Look at the strength of the Sikh community, my friends. Look at the strength of the Sikh community to the point where Canada is basically able to enter diplomatic disputes with India that are going so far as the cancellation of visa. Meanwhile, let's be honest here. Canada has foreign students. The number one community of foreign students is Indian, 40%. Foreign students bring in a lot of money. I mean, <laughs> they get charged, what, two to three times more uh, in colleges and universities than uh, national students. So to me, what is happening here, and of course, it will settle, it will calm down. Uh, two states are not very likely to end diplomatic uh, relations when they have economies that connect, when they have strong cultures, when they have both not only a former colonizer, uh, Great Britain, they're both part of the Commonwealth, but at the same time, uh, Canada is seen positively in India, and the Indian community diaspora is seen very positively in Canada. I mean, you don't think in Canada, you don't think of extremism and you think Indian or even you don't think Sikh. However, the dispute is more in terms of what's happening in India because the Sikh, uh, there are some Sikh militants, S-I-K-H, just to, just to make sure, who are basically fighting for the creation of a Sikh ethno-religious independent state uh, by the name of Khalistan. So um, this is having an impact in terms of Canada-India relations because to give you perspectives, it would be as if the Indian government was uh, hosting a large community of French Quebecers and they were notably giving them room to advocate for the independence of Quebec. We can be sure that Canada would not take that very well. Now, it's not for me to... It's not about, I mean, we're black people. We're not here to choose Canada, India. We are in Canada. We are proud of being Canadians. And I do agree with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. If this sick person has a Canadian passport, he's therefore a Canadian citizen, and no foreign government can be uh, can think it's okay to come kill a Canadian on Canadian soil. If I don't agree with that, then that would be like saying, hey, Dr. Vi, what's your background? Did you say Jamaica? The Jamaican government could come kill you despite you being a Canadian citizen, having a passport and paying your taxes. That would be totally wrong, just as me, born in Cameroon. Let's say the, the Cameroonian government gets offended of something that I say, and they decided, like, no, to take me out. No. So, yes, I am totally supporting Canada. So what are the lessons for us as Black people? Because that's really what concerns us. Let me repeat what I just said. Look at the strength of the Sikh community. Look at the strength of a community which, let's be honest, in India is a small community. In India, the Sikh community is not a big community. But in Canada, they hold weight. There they you go. Weight. There you go. They, they, they hold look, if a prime minister is backing them, 
that that that's a that's a pretty significant statement. And again, we can learn. We can learn. We can learn. That's what I'm saying. I mean, let's give, let's forget India. Let's give another community that we have realized how much power they have, the Ukrainian community. Sure, you can say they look quite just like the Franco Ontarians or the, the Quebecois or the Anglo Saxons. No, Eastern Europeans, Ukrainian community. Our finest minister and vice. Vice Prime Minister Christian Freeland is of Ukrainian heritage. You see, the strength of a community where they come to Canada as refugees, they get the red carpet rolled to them. But if you come from Haiti or Ethiopia, you know, Afghanistan, yep. you get a different type of treatment. So, uh, you know, as Black people, this is a good reminder, a lesson for us to build stronger communities we should not we should not act like you know this is not of our interest no the Sikh community truly has been to canada in the last 40 years notably with the the discrimination and the violence that they were suffering in india as i give the example of the uh, attack on the golden temple and in 40 years they have built a community strong enough to impact not only provincial politics, but also federal politics. I mean, we can't pretend that we don't see the Sikh parliamentary members next to Pierre Poiliev and before a certain uh, Harper, Stephen Harper. And they're there in parliament with the turban. Meanwhile, we have black people who are ashamed, scared of wearing traditional African outfits in public. Jagmeet Singh, Jagmeet Singh, Jagmeet Singh didn't take off his turban because, oh my God, now I'm leader of a political party in, in Canada, you know, I must, I must integrate, let me fix my beard. He stayed true to his identity and he's been yep. there now for years, the yep. sick community. Point. So we talk, I often, you know, I always talk about what the successful communities, Jewish, but yeah, okay, let's say they're white, Chinese, Indian, sick, technically sick are Indians, but you see what I mean? The sick community, there you go. So this is for us to learn. This is for us to build strong communities. The good wars are basically the cultural temp, the cultural centers. They are there in the big cities. It's interesting you mentioned that, just to build on that. Sorry to interrupt. I'll let you finish mm -hmm. your point. Go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I was just saying, it's interesting in media, you don't see as much as a, don't see as much a negative portrayal of those cultures mm -hmm. as our own. <laughs> because it's strong. When you're strong, it helps to protect you. It doesn't mean that you won't be attacked. There's still anti, uh, anti-Semitism going on. But, you know, the Jewish George Floyd is not exactly someone that we hear about in the news. Meanwhile, every month, there's a new black George Floyd. The Chinese every month, George every day. Every day. Every so day. So oh, that right, because we, 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 we only hear about the extreme, one of those every day. And let's not forget that we have sisters who also Same get thing. killed. Sandra yes. Bland, for example. There's many. So, but we don't hear about where's the Jewish uh, George Floyd? Where's the Chinese George Floyd? Where's the Sikh George Floyd? Don't get me wrong. There should never be one. I am not here saying there should be one or no, there should never be one. So why is it that we're having black versions of George Floyd of Sandra Bland? Those are the ones that make it to the media. So imagine the vast amount that never make it from here in Canada all the way to Brazil and going to Europe, going to uh, uh, Israel, going to Australia. Australia, the country that jails the most children. children, And those children, they're not white children. The indigenous blacks. That's what I mean. All right. Okay, let's move to our final conversation topic today, and we're ending up on an upbeat. 
Cesar brought this to our information. UN report urges countries to consider financial reparations for transatlantic slavery. Uh, this is near to very much near and dear to Cesar's heart, and I think it should be near to, to any black person's heart. But uh, Cesar, mm -hmm. thank you so much for bringing this table. Can you give us a lowdown on this? Well, basically, uh, and I think Dr. Vab, you may have the the photo story. Of yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring this the photo first, and then I'll bring the story. So no let's see if we can do... Okay, we're going to do the photo first. Hopefully it's going to come up, going to come up, here, going to come up. It's going to think here. All right, let's bring... Okay, here we go. Here goes the photo. Thank you, thank you. Uh, well, basically, uh, end of May, beginning of June, I had the honor, among others, including uh, Roots and Culture CEO Ketia Peters and uh, Roots and Culture Program Director Mark Jacob, of uh, uh, being selected to be at the United Nations to represent the Canadian Black Civil Society uh, in the context of the United, United Nations Permanent Forum for People of African Descent. And the issue of reparations for slavery is, not only was then, but is still a central one to address. So the United Nations this week, basically including uh, the Secretary, uh, the Secretary um, General, uh, the United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Gutierrez, Basically, the UN uh, is moving forward with not only recognition, but truly speaking of financial reparations for the transatlantic slave trade of Africans. Now, how can I put it? I think this is a great thing. Obviously, this is something I stand for. I am absolutely 100% behind the notion of reparations. Uh, for those who would like to criticize it, um, the Jewish community has gotten reparations in regards to the Holocaust, the Shoah, the Holocaust of Jewish people, and they are still getting reparations uh, to this day. Uh, in Canada, as I believe in the United States, uh, the Japanese community has gotten reparations in regards to the internment in camps of Japanese people uh, during World War II. Uh, it's very uh, clear that we can talk of reparations to indigenous peoples, notably here in Canada, at the cost of billions in the name of uh, uh, residential schools, uh, child welfare, and the very Canadian state having stolen land and having caused not just cultural genocide, but genocide of all types to indigenous people. So why not black people? Well, why not? We should have the reparations. Uh, those who want to make the argument of how far back are you willing to go in history uh, for reparations because etc. people have enslaved one another. Well, first of all, that's a false argument. Reparations are occurring notably because people have been targeted on a ethnographic lens, meaning Africans did not get enslaved simply because there was slavery. They got enslaved because they were Africans. Blackness became condemned. There was legal, so basic, so those who committed slavery were not committing slavery simply because they wanted to or because they could. The state was sponsoring the enslavement of black people. Uh, the very fact that we have today um, Western names, uh, many from the Bible, or uh, Muslim names, notably from the Quran, are legacies of slavery. Now, one of my first criticism of this, and I was one of the rare ones to address this at the United Nations, as I didn't get to have two minutes to speak <laughs> for those three days I was there. I was never picked to speak, but one of the things that is important to remind our black people, 
the enslavement of black people by the white Europeans basically lasted the earliest date I can give you with my historical knowledge is 1443 by the Portuguese off the coast of Capo Verde to until 1888 again by the Portuguese in Brazil. However, the enslavement of black people, like the targeted enslavement of black people by the white Arab Muslims began in 639 with the treaty called Bact. And the mm. Sudan people were the first ones to be victimized by this, where mm -hmm. basically in order to avoid war, you have to give us slaves. And although I would like to tell you that slavery of Africans by the white Arab Muslims ended, some people would tell you like 1962, uh, Saudi Arabia. So two years before Malcolm X went to visit uh, Saudi Arabia for his pilgrimage, uh, no, the truth of the matter is not even 1980, Mauritania, where uh, our brothers and sisters, who are Haratin, are still enslaved by the white Moors called Bedans. The enslavement of black people by white Arab Muslims is still ongoing today, notably in North Africa, as we saw in 2017 with Libya, but as well uh, when you look at the Middle East, with working conditions uh, that are called modern day slavery all over the Middle East from Lebanon to Qatar, etc. So yes, this is a great step forward. It's an important step forward. Uh, and this is all part of a bigger conversation in terms of the restitution of African art to the Africans. You know, the missionaries, notably priests, white priests, were convincing Africans that the uh, the art was witchcraft and therefore to burn it or to give it to the white missionaries and those missionaries, notably priests, what did they do? They put them in the museums in Europe and North America and they got rich off it. Meanwhile, they imposed upon blacks the statues of Jesus, the statues of Mary, etc. And we still, for far too many of us, we still perpetuate the consequences of slavery and colonization upon our people, notably with honoring the legacy of the ideologies of our oppressors. Even me, Cesar, there's no such a thing as an African named Cesar in a world where we have white, no white people is called Kofi. Show me the white person who is named after an African emperor, after an African king. Show me that white kid born since 2008 named Obama. And here I am, a Pan-Africanist, a black community leader, black and proud as I am, African around my neck, first name Cesar. That's slavery and colonization. I know we're, we're coming to the top of the clock because I know the boss of the house will be probably looking for you. But I just want to ask, and I think we need to have a further conversation down the line. And maybe get a number of representatives and maybe international conversation about this. Oh, I'm, I got them. I got them. Okay. Well, I, I, well let's I, talk I mean, offline. I mean, let's, I mean, let's bring, let's bring, let's make it happen. My concern when it comes to reparations, people will talk about it, but mm -hmm. when the aspect of money comes up, crickets. Well, there's a reason why. And I mean, there is a reason why. And look, we were talking about the Sikh community and how uh, Canada's Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, I mean, let's be honest, Justin Trudeau is not even standing up for the Sikh community. He's not. A Canadian citizen was killed, according to reports, by a foreign government. Justin Trudeau is doing his job. It just happens this person is of the Sikh community. But again, it speaks to the strength of that community, which is this, the difference in terms of in Canada, the Sikh community is strong. In India, it is not strong. So you get a completely different treatment of the same community, which is here when it comes to 
reparations for slavery, is the black community strong? Are we a strong community in these Western countries in order of thinking that we truly could get financial reparations for the transatlantic slavery? Yes, there are, there are black families that not only got some type of reparations for injustices upon them during segregation. I'm thinking notably of a black family that owned a piece of uh, the beach in LA and they got reparations after, I don't know if it's a century. Yep, 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 yep. There are communities notably um, uh, in Africa that got some form of reparations. I'm thinking here about, I might be wrong, but I'm thinking here about the Herero and the Nama the survivors of the first genocide of the 20th century. So sometimes people, they hear genocide, they all, uh, they right away think about the Jewish community. No, no, no. The first genocide of the 20th century, I believe 1905, 1907, was committed in Africa by the Second Reich. The Second Reich is uh, basically the Second Empire, the Second German Empire. Hitler and the Nazi, that's the Third Right, the Third Empire. Under the Second Empire, they killed, the Germans killed 50 to 70% of all the Hereros and Namas in what today we call Namibia and uh, nearby countries. So they got some form of reparations. Right. But those are the minorities, the minutes, the very minority groups and communities and families that got any type of reparations. And then, even if reparations does occur, how would that money be managed? Who would get that money? Why would we... Uh, that's I, am, a whole, I, am not a fan, I am not a fan of giving a check to a person simply because they're black. Mm, the there's, well, I am there's not, a, I am well, not a fan. We're, 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 we're going to hold that conversation because, because there, are, there are people who take that side saying, but people say we don't want to give it to a lot of organizations because we can't trust them either. That's also, you see, that's also part of a problem. So again, before a check comes, we got to work on ourselves because let me put it to you in perspective here. Imagine right now, whether you win the lottery or you become rich and famous, if you don't have a structured mind to manage your money, yeah. one way or the other, you will become broke. Well, the, uh, what, there's always these surveys on what percentage of people win the lottery become broke within five years. There you go. So right, right now, as a community, I'm not saying as individual. As individual, yeah. whether you give me a thousand, a million, or ten or a hundred million dollars, I will manage it well. But that's yes, because you I'm already managing well my money. But that's me as an individual. I am not each and every black person. So right. this goes back to one of the things that I denounce, the three cancers of the black psyche, entertainment number one, consumerism number two, and number three, religion. In terms of the black community, when you notice these three cancers, entertainment, consumerism, and religion, giving disparately large sum of money to individuals simply because they are black is bound to be a failure. I am telling you, give a check to most black people right now. Monday to Thursday, that money will be gone between Friday and Sunday. Why? They will be at the mosque. They will be at the temple. They will be in church. And they will spend that money right there. The bank account or the realities of the family will not have improved intergenerationally. And that is a fundamental failure. The state of Israel went from kibbutz, kibbutzim, basically... Yeah. Uh, communities in the desert, and yes, the, whatever the relations, the conflict with the Palestinians is a different topic. There's anti-Black Palestinian racism among Palestinians, just as there's anti-Black Jewish racism among the Jewish people. So that conflict is not my issue. But the state of Israel went from kibbutzim to uh, 1947, two states, to a state, no matter how some people want to call it, Zionist, whatever you want to call it, but a state that not only received are the number one receivers of U.S. military and economic aid, but yeah. also of European aid and also of reparations. The state of Israel is a state that weighs a lot. And FYI, as we speak about reparations, the state of Israel is an observer state at the African Union. 
Meanwhile, Haiti, first nation that started a revolution to end slavery, is also an observer state. That's a, that's a travesty of black pride. We'll end it on that note. Excellent stuff today. So as right, I said, before, so before, we, before we started today, we're sort of jumbalying around in regards to conversation topics. But you know what? We just bring something up and Cesar brings the heat. So as always, Cesar, I want to thank you for taking time out of your positive productive schedule. Most importantly, as a dad, as a father, as a, a change maker, a great change maker. Thank you. With our with our with our people, we are so happy to get you when we can get you, uh, you know that, and we get you when we can. So I want to say thank you so much. Anything you'd like to end off with, or anything coming up that we need to be on the watch for? Uh, yes. So last time I was talking about it, but allow me to add further. Uh, I want to congratulate Natif TV, uh, the first uh, uh, they say multicultural. Uh, television so television but also web tv channel in quebec where basically uh you know we say minorities but truly we are not minorities we are the global majority non-white european people will be seen uh under better positive light on the quebec screen at the same time uh uh, there is an event coming if you're in Ottawa, October 7. I uh, will be part of a panel that will basically uh, address some issues impacting uh, uh, black males uh, in Canada, in the area. Uh, I will definitely send that info to you, Dr. Vibe. Please uh, do. So, yeah, that's basically, that's basically what's happening. And for all our people there, keep growing in your black pride. I'm so proud to see youth asking questions. I'm proud of seeing people, uh, you know, like I go to uh, Afrofest, uh, when there was the Afrofest here in Ottawa, and people noticing, you know, how I'm dressed, coming forward, asking questions, you know, whether it be on religion or politics or society, people talking about wanting to connect with the, the roots of the ancestors, wanting to know the truth. People who have seen me uh, on TV, seen me on panels, on conferences, on debates, on Dr. Vibe, uh, please, my people, grow in your pride. This century can be an African century. It can be a black century. Our statistics predict 2100, one third of all humans will be Africans. I did not even say black. I said Africans, one third of humans. Let us make sure that we don't have one third of humans who are still mentally enslaved, mentally colonized. Let us exit those uh, chains of mental oppression that have been put over our people. Thank you, Excellent. Dr. Vibe, for the work you're doing towards that. No, it's, it's hard work, not hard work anymore, my brother. There is his contact information, email, president, rootsandculturecanada.com, Facebook, Cesar Remy Emery. And I will just add before we let Cesar go, uh, as one of my gentlemen I respect said to me today, just don't know your truth, tell your truth. Indeed. So thank you very much, Cesar. Thank as you, always, Dr. Vibe. Pleasure. All right, family. Another epic conversation. Cesar brought it, didn't he? Didn't he bring it? Did he not bring it? Big time. So before we close out, if you want to watch replays of this epic conversation called Black Canada Talking, go to The Dr. Vibe Show, YouTube, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Also, go to my website, the thedrvibeshow.com, and some other housekeeping things before we get out of here today. Please subscribe to the Dr. Vibe Show on YouTube and hit the notification button so you get notified of upcoming conversations. we got a number of those coming up all the time. And also to advertise your business or service or your product on the Dr. Vibe Show platform, email me drvibe at the drvibeshow.com. So this is how we close it out. Oh, you know one other thing, how you can contact me. Sorry about that. Website, the drvibeshow.com. Email address dr. Period at the drvibeshow.com, YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, the Doctor Vibe Show, Twitter slash X. I guess it's soon got to be X at drvibeshow, and then finally Instagram at the drvibeshow. 
So we close out with this. Live your life as a dream. If you can dream it, you can make it. Sometimes you have to get small to get stronger. Block assumptions. Then aim bigger, aim better, aim higher, aim wider. Love, faith, and respect. And remember to give yourselves grace. Keep the faith. God bless. Be well. Walk good.